So one of the things that I uh, realized watching the lightning talks last night, save your keynote presentation on the first slide. I saw like two guys blow their jokes by loading it up when they plugged into the projector and it was right on like, you know, the punchline. So this is actually my first slide. <clears throat> uh, my name is Adam Wiggins. I'm the author of Rust Client. Uh, this handsome devil over here is Blake Mizerani and he's the author of Sinatra. We want to talk about how you can use these tools to build web services. Um, and the first, before talking about what the tools are, I want to talk about what they're for. To do that, I want to tell the story kind of of how I discovered Sinatra. Um, and that story is actually kind of the story, I think, of uh, every application that's ever been written. When an app is first born, it's clean, it's well organized, maybe a few dozen classes. Uh, it's small and beautiful. Now, if the application provides value, people want new features, of course. You write new classes to support those features, new views, new tests. Over time, it grows organically, and over the course of years, it proceeds into its middle age. And Eventually, it seems like all applications end up in the same place, which is hundreds of classes, hundreds or even thousands of views, this huge test harness that takes forever to run. Um, in short, a mess. And having lived through this a few times um, and being working on a, a, a new application that I was seeing starting to grow in complexity, and I felt like, God, can we escape this cycle? Is there a way? out of this, or is this just always where we end up, and that's just the way of it. <clears throat> and I had a small epiphany thinking about that, which was just that when programmers want to deal with complexity, what we do normally is, um, you know, if you had a really complicated class, for example, you would break it apart. You'd break it into smaller pieces. That's what we do is break, thing, break a larger problem down into smaller, more manageable chunks. But usually we think of applications as being kind of atomic, monolithic. Uh, you don't really break an application down. It, it, it all needs to share the same code base. It needs to share the same database. But actually, you can break an application apart. Um, and when you do, the result is web services. Now, uh, you might think of a public web service, probably the most famous of which is the Amazon S3. Um, and, but there's not really any difference whether it's an internal or an external service. If, if you're making a service that's internal to your company or your product, um, it's got an API, it's, got, it's, it's a standalone application. Um, public versus, versus internal actually doesn't matter. As long as it's a standalone app, doesn't share a database, uh, but that is not in itself a complete end product, it's a piece of a larger whole. Like in the case of S3, it's providing you a resource by itself that wouldn't be useful to make an, for an end product. It's, it's a tool for something else. So having realized that web services was a way to deal with this monolithic, monstrous app problem that we always seem to face, um, I dived into trying to uh, divide up uh, my current project this way. Um, and of course, being a Ruby developer, when I go to make a web application, I want to carve off a little piece of my big application into a small one. And of course, I reach for the tool that my big application was written in and that you normally reach for, which is Rails. But, and I built it that way. But then I noticed kind of it didn't feel right. Um, and I feel, as I was looking through it, I saw that my service, which was actually a pretty small bit of code, maybe 20 or 30 lines of code, um, and then I compared that to all the, the boilerplate code that sort of came out of Rails. Like, I, the, my business logic was actually dwarfed by like the boilerplate code. And I felt like my code for my web service was being lost in this sea of like boilerplate and empty directories. So basically, Rails gives you all this infrastructure, which is great when you need it. When you don't need it, it feels like red tape. In short, Rails was basically just too much for the specific purpose of building a small web service. So then I decided to go to the other extreme, and I built a bear mongrel handler. Nowadays, what you would do is a rack app. At this time, rack didn't exist. But um, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but this is basically the sort of the PHP equivalent uh, for Ruby, where you make a script that just its input is the web request, and the output is whatever you feel like. And it's just totally unstructured um, and very basic. And this actually worked OK. I wrote a couple of web services this way, and I, and I kind of liked it. Um, they, they definitely, I didn't have the feeling of, that it was too much. 
But as soon as it started to grow a little bit, I felt like um, it just didn't give enough, um, certainly not enough like helpers. I was sort of reinventing the wheel, but also it didn't give enough structure. And that's, of course, the problem with PHP, right, is that like, it's great when it's four lines long, but then when it gets a little bigger, the lack of any sort of imposed structure and organization means that uh, it just sort of uh, gets messy really quickly. So in short, these were too little. So I decided that what I needed uh, after doing some research was a micro framework. Um, and there's a few out there, but uh, the one that I is, I think, the most popular and, and probably the best known is Sinatra. Um, and I think it strikes a good balance between that providing you the structure and the, and the support that you want to write a web service uh, or a small web app, but not being so minimalist that you just have no um, you have nothing, no structure to work within. But it's kind of weird, and if you haven't seen a Sinatra app before, um, I'm going to show you a hello world here. When I first saw Sinatra apps, my immediate reaction was, man, that is weird. One of the things that, that struck me first off is like, where's the class definition? There's no, there's no classes. What's going on? There's really two functional lines in this particular program. One is the get slash. So that defines the verb, the, the web uh, verb, and a URI, in this case slash. Um, and then it gives a block that will execute when that action is uh, hit by a client. Um, and in this case, and the return value of the block is what will be sent back. So in this case, it's just a, a static string, hello world. Another weird thing about Sinatra that I noticed right away is that the way you run it. I was used to script server. Um, other frameworks have their own standalone binaries. When you go to run a Sinatra program, it looks like this. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty weird. But really, that shouldn't be very weird. I mean, this is Ruby, right? Why wouldn't we run it with Ruby? So that's kind of interesting. Let's look at a uh, slightly bigger example to, uh, or, or a, a real example, I should say. Uh, the uh, everyone's favorite, the blog. This has got two actions. The first one is a post uh, to slash posts. And um, here I'm assuming that I've got an active record object defined in the lib posts. Could just be a, you know, a two line file there. Um, and when I get a post to slash posts in the block, I'm going to create it with the params, params being a, uh, a, a variable that Sinatra passes you, and then I'm going to use a redirect to redirect to posts and the post ID. Um, and right off the bat, one thing you might notice there is that there's no helper to construct your URL. I just make it. Um, and again, this struck me as pretty weird at first, but it grew on me pretty quickly. Um, URLs are actually not very hard to build, um, and in a lot of ways, this is actually shorter and easier to understand than using some sort of helper. So then the second action is a get. Here we see a variable inside the URL. So I'm getting slash post slash ID, and that will create a named variable inside the params hash. And so I can do a post.find just the way that you might do it in, uh, uh, in any framework that's using active record. And then I use the ERB helper to render the post template. I find it really impressive that you can put what is basically a real application, I mean, it's a very small application, but it's a real application and it's complete, minus the view and, and, and the, uh, the database schema definition. This is a whole app and I can fit it onto a slide with 36 or 48 point font or whatever this is. Um, I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to find another web framework uh, or, or way at all to build a web application uh, that lets you do so much with so little. Now, that's not to say that Sinatra doesn't have lots of cool features. Um, the uh, required bullet list here, templating with a bunch of different uh, options like ERB and Haml or XML Builder. Uh, you can do full testing with whatever test suite you happen to like before filters, helpers, uh, defining error handlers for different kind of errors. Um, inline templates, which is a really cool feature. I'm gonna come, come back to that in a moment. Um, code reloading when you're in development mode. Um, some really nice HTTP caching um, using e tags and, and last modified and so forth. Um, and of course, it's a rack framework, which any good framework these days is. But Sinatra takes 
even more advantage of it than just sort of letting, you know, as a way to, to use Mongrel or Thin or whatever. Uh, but it actually has uh, inline middleware and a really easy way to take the cool middleware that's available for Rack and integrate it into your Sinatra uh, app in a more direct way. But overall, the thing that I loved the best about uh, Sinatra and, and, and made me choose it over all the other choices is that it has a commitment to small that I think is unparalleled. And you see this uh, in the app itself, um, the, you know, the, the interior that we've already looked at. You also see, that in fact, there's no directory structure. Um, there's no boilerplate. Uh, there's no routing. Um, this is a minimalist nirvana. And uh, I find myself going more and more down this path of minimalism and trying to do more with less and fewer lines of code. Um, and so that makes Sinatra really attractive to me. Um, and it's not just your Sinatra apps that are small, it's actually Sinatra itself that is small. One thing that you'll notice if you go on GitHub and look at the code, there's actually, when you require Sinatra, there's really only one file, sinatra.rb. Um, and uh, just out of curiosity, I ran some line counts on a couple of frameworks. Uh, Rails, of course, is a, is a heavyweight. It includes a lot of stuff that they had to write themselves at the time, so it might, might not quite be fair to put that up there. But uh, Merbcore, Remez, uh, Camping, which um, was kind of kicked off the micro framework um, style, Wise, Wydalefki Stiff's um, framework, which is incredibly small and does, of course, all kinds of meta magic. Um, but Sinatra is actually smaller than any of them, even Camping. Um, and of course, it does a lot more. Um, so it's, it's, it's living the principles that it's, uh, uh, that, it's, that it's feeding you, the application developer. And one last thing about uh, Sinatra. Uh, that is that it is a proud Ruby citizen. Um, and we've seen that kind of already a little bit in the, how you run it. You run it with Ruby. Um, but, um, you know, when Rails was made, the Ruby ecosystem was not as diverse. Um, they had to build a lot of stuff, ORMs and templating and test harnesses and all this stuff. Since then, the Ruby ecosystem has grown so massively. Um, and there's just so many great options out there for ORMs and templating and tests and specs and JavaScript libraries and so forth. Um, you know, you can go the route of having sort of adapters for each of these things you might want to use, say each ORM. Uh, Merb does that. I think Remez does that. The thing that Sinatra does that I just love, again, it tickles that minimalist, that minimalist fetish of mine, is just that there's no adapters. There's no code in Sinatra that, that helps you define which of these things you can use. Um, with, with the, uh, you know, there's a few, few helpers here and there for certain uh, templating things, but for the most part, it's just like you just use it, right? You install the gem, you require it, and you just use it. Um, and that, to me, is, is, is pretty powerful, and it makes me feel much more like I'm writing Ruby and less like I'm writing some special world within that, uh, the framework that I happen to be using. So uh, I want to show a couple of examples real quick that are open source uh, and you might have seen. And um, uh, Blake knows more about these than I do, so I'll probably let him uh, talk about them a little bit. Yeah. OK, so this is uh, GitWiki. I wanted to show this example because, um, you know, as Adam said, that Sinatra is very small. It's, it's tiny. And because of that, if you look at GitWiki, again, 355 lines of code, um, it's actually a really, really cool uh, little wiki system that uses Git. Go figure. Um, but that 355 it was, includes the views, by the way. Oh, That's everything. Nice. So anyway, the, um, because, because it's so small and it was so easy to just look at, it's all in one file. Um, if you go on GitHub and take a look at the uh, network graph, it's it's been forked all over the place, and the network graph just goes like this. I mean, it's just everywhere. People just started with it and went off in just a million different directions with it, and I think that's a testament to um, the the simplicity of Sinatra because it's so easy that you can just go fork it and you know just start. You don't really have to dig around too much to really understand what's going on with the um, with all the routing and the and, and, and the app itself because Sinatra apps usually the the Sinatra part of it is so tiny. Um, but anyway, yeah, I definitely go take a look at that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty killer. Um, I wanted to show off uh, inline templates. Um, this is one of my favorites because I'm just a huge fan of keeping everything in one file. Um, <laughs> but uh, as you can see here, um, that we can, uh, I'm taking advantage of the, um, the end macro there and being able to, uh, using the add add signs, we can actually define templates, multiple templates, in the actual Sinatra app file. Um, so here you can see, you know, you've got your layout and your show, 
And um, I don't know, I just think it's pretty cool. I'd really like to show off. I, I, I didn't know about this before I came across this in Git Wiki, the underscore underscore end. Do you guys, do you guys know about this? You, this is actually a standard Ruby thing. You can just anywhere in the file, underscore, underscore, end, underscore, underscore, and then everything after that is ignored. And yeah. so then you can read your own file and use that to do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and Sinatra cleverly uses it to define some views. And here again, we've got not only the action, but the view for a, a complete wiki page. This is real code from Git Wiki that fits onto a slide. I mean, actually, how else could you do that? Actually, the end, it, um, it puts all the data. It, it puts everything after end in the data constant, um, capital D-A-T-A. -A. Um, but I did a little bit of magic with uh, caller um, on this because I wanted you to be able to, wherever you actually call using file templates, um, I want it, that's the file that has the templates. So you can have, if you have multiple Sinatra apps and they're all running in the same thin and you need different templates but you want to use in file templates, I, so I kind of, I did some little magic there. But, um, but yeah, I just, but because of the fact that I can ignore all of that and then just split on end and take everything off the bottom, it's pretty cool. Uh, this one, go yeah, this next example is uh, something I put together recently. Um, GitWiki, of course, is just a small app, but this is actually a web service, um, and uh, Sinatra just turned out to be completely perfect for it. 61 lines of Ruby, uh, a little bit of view. It's kind of a cheat because the graph is in Flash, but um, this is actually what I mean when I say a web service that's a piece of a larger thing. This is not a product in and of itself. Uh, really quickly, Riffgraph is just has a REST API. You can just post a value to it, and you can post these values over time, like from a cron job or whatever. It's just kind of fire and forget. Um, and then you can go and view a graph of the data that you've stuffed in there. Um, and the problem I was trying to solve here is the thing where putting your metrics data inside your application database is one of those things that makes apps get so huge and unwieldy over time. Is of course, you always want to track some stuff. You put them in a table in your database. Now your database is huge. It's really annoying. Um, so this is, this is a potential solution to that, and it's open source. You can install it yourself, or you can use it as, a, as just a web service on its uh, riffcraft.heroku.com uh, address. Um, but it's, it's a little piece of something that you can use elsewhere, and it's, it's totally standalone. It's got its own database, and it's its own application, um, but, it's, but it's something that would be a, a tool to be used elsewhere. All right, so uh, GitHub services, how many of you use GitHub? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> um, so now you know whenever you uh, you know you install like Lighthouse or all those post all those prefabricated poster C folks that you have, such as uh, Lighthouse, uh, Twitter, you know IRC, all of that. That's all uh, a Sinatra app. That's uh, if you go to PJ Hyatt's uh, repository, it's GitHub Services. And uh, when they open source that, it was also it, again I think it was a testament not only to how awesome GitHub is because you can just fork and they use the, they took advantage of their own software to go and say, hey, go write all your own post receive hooks and we'll incorporate them in. But um, if you look at the Sinatra in, uh, in GitHub services, it's like four lines of code. It's like this big. Everything else is all vendored off um, for, for all the Twitter libraries, everything. Um, it's, it's really cool. And there was actually a really cool trick in there that someone, uh, one of the guys who forked it and refactored it down, they uh, put yield inside. And I learned something completely new about instance eval that you could do all this yielding and stuff. It's pretty crazy. But uh, <laughs> Well, and, and, and one really interesting point on this, too, is that, you know, Benefits of web services, I'm speaking mostly in terms of like just the, the cleanliness of the organization, being able to break things off into pieces into smaller apps. Uh, but there's actually like scalability benefits. Obviously, if you can run apps, you can spread those out easily across machines in a very clean way, um, since they don't share a database and they don't share. And you've got security benefits. And in this case, they're running something that is potentially user contributed code that they're running on their servers. Uh, but they can run that as its own user on its own server. It's very much isolated in a Unix way. It's using the Unix security because it's running as its own user and it has no access whatsoever to their, to their main database. Right. And also, um, the, the traffic that this thing takes is pretty substantial. There's about uh, 5,000 people, um, and I asked the GitHub guys for this number. There's, about, there's over 5,000 uh, users on GitHub that do use, uh, take advantage of these post-receive hooks, and um, you can just imagine the amount of pushing that gets thrown to these things, and there's only, I, I can't remember the number, but I think it was like just a couple models running with uh, running this one app on that server, and it just, it just stays there. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, this last example is uh, one of my own that I just threw together recently. Um, I recently realized that blogging software totally sucks. Um, it took me a long time to realize this, but uh, I finally did and realized the wisdom of write your own blog is really, um, is really correct, even though it seems like reinventing the wheel. Uh, I put it together really quickly in a couple of days. Less than 200 lines of Ruby, 
does everything I need, done. Um, so I think that's, you know, again, it's not a service, it's just an app, but, um, you know, this, this minimalist sort of like uh, uh, path that I've been going down, it's just been, uh, I don't know, it's just been uh, so enjoyable to me. So that's the server side of web services. Um, now we're going to talk about the client side. Right. And uh, do, do you see what we're doing here? He, he wrote REST client. And he's talking about Sinatra, and I wrote Sinatra. I'm talking about REST client. <laughs> so you can't. It was all. He, he couldn't get up and say how awesome Sinatra was the way that I can, because it would just sound like bragging. But me, me, I can say how good it really is. So um, anyway, I, how many of you have used Active Resource once, twice, a thousand times? Right. Yeah, it was, it's really cool. I. Um, uh, it was. Um, you know, the, you've got the object model and you can map it to a URL and then everything looks like an object, but it's really talking over the web and it's awesome and it's kind of too much sometimes. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's great when you're in Rails and, and you're in that environment and it just kind of fits right in and, you know, um, it's, you know, it's, it's perfect for that. Um, unfortunately, if you're trying to use Sinatra and then you want to use Active Resource, they don't quite play along too well together. And um, unless, you're in, unless you're following the, you know, standard format, the XML that, that Active Resource needs. Um, so, one of the things that you can use instead is NetHttp. How many of you have tried to, uh, you know, do a, a HTTP request with NetHttp? How many of you enjoyed it? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 pretty cumbersome and it's and it's not fun and it's also too little. Um, so the the alternative, um, Adam, uh, um, you know, had been like you said, had been using Sinatra for for a little while and. Uh, um, I remember when he was presenting at ICHRS client, he was, you know, I don't mean to put too many words in your mouth, but he was just like, you know, uh, I, somebody has got to have done this, you know, I need to be able to just make a quick little tiny request. So he wound up coming up with REST client. And uh, I first ran across REST client when uh, a friend of mine uh, sent me an email with a link to this and um, to the to the R docs on, on RubyForge and he just said, check it, reverse Sinatra. And I was like, well, that's, and I took a look at it and it, it literally is. If you look at the code to do a get request, it's get URL, right? Like, we're not scared of URLs, and you know, Adam and I, we're, we're totally cool with them. We don't need helpers and all this. We just, we've got a URL, we've got a resource, we just want to throw it in there and we just need to get a, you know, make a quick request. Um, so that's the get request. Um, again, you can do post request uh, the same way. Um, and you can send it, you know, uh, parameters, uh, you know, very intuitively. Uh, but I think my favorite part is probably because I'm biased and because I contributed this part was the console. Um, you can actually go in. It defaults to uh, localhost 4567, which is the default port that Sinatra runs on. So uh, if you just type in REST client and you've got a little Sinatra demo app running, then you pop up a console and you can just start posting and getting from it. Um, and it's. It's, it's really cool because I like to think of it as like an interactive curl. It's a, a better curl for us, right? Um, from the command line, you can do REST client get and then the URL and then, you know, stream it out to, to a file. So now you don't actually have to go into the console. You can skip that step and then use this right on the command line. Um, and if you ever need to drop back down in the command line, just get rid of the get, go back in the console. Uh, but truly one of the coolest things, I remember when Adam put this in there and uh, uh, because we work together and, and we sit a couple feet apart and always talk through IRC because we're geeks, um, he had sent me this link and he showed me that this, this new logging that he had thrown in and I was like, this is, this is killer. Um, so REST client logging, if you say uh, you, can, you can set it to a file to standard out um, wherever, you know, wherever you need it to go, but what it does is it actually prints out the REST client Ruby. It prints out exactly what it's doing with the commented, you know, what your re you know, the result was. Um, you know, as you can see here, but what's so cool about that is you could pipe that to like if you're using a map PB copy or you can, you know, copy it off the console and then plug it right into a file and then hit run, you know, and just run that through Ruby and it'll replay it all over again, exactly what just happened. So if you're trying to debug an app that's making, res you know, calls out to external resources and you're like, whoa, 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 went wrong, I don't know, I don't get this, uh, just, just go ahead and start up the REST client logging and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty cool. So uh, let's go through a couple examples. Um, there is uh, the Heroku client. Um, you can take a look, it's on Adam Wiggins' branch. Um, this is uh, what, this is how you, did you want to talk about this? Well, I was okay. going to say that this is actually not interesting and that's why I put it up here. <laughs> the thing is, almost every service out there, which any company that's making a piece of technology in this day and age, you've got an API. And then you often want to give a client which wraps up that API just kind of nicely. And so everyone ends up reinventing this same wheel 
Um, and I was thinking about this just the other day as I was looking at Blink Sales little client. And they have a little class and they're named REST client. Um, and it's, you know, they basically end up implementing this because everyone needs it. Everyone needs to be able to hit their, hit their API and, and, and something a little higher level than that HTTP. So the Heroku client uses it. It's not actually interesting. It's just an example of when you have a service that needs an API call, this is just a really, really easy way to do that. Um, a much more interesting example uh, is Couchrest, um, which is done by Chris uh, Anderson, I think. Um, and this is the Ruby client for CouchDB. So this is how you interact with CouchDB. And I don't know if you guys are, how familiar you guys are with CouchDB, but I think it's kind of the, the premier document database, uh, open source document database right now. Um, and of course, it's a web server. It serves documents through HTTP. Um, so of course, again, you're making REST calls. Um, and again, this is a place where thinking of trying to use active resource with this, that doesn't make any sense at all. You're talking to an Erlang app that's a database. Um, active resource is very, very constrained to the sort of the Rails way of doing things. Um, so uh, Chris told me that you know REST client was a perfect fit for what he needed. He was able to make the CouchDB client. So if you're using CouchDB from Ruby, uh, you're using REST client. I want to talk about some of these principles behind this sort of the one-two punch of Sinatra and, and REST client and uh, this, this, um, this path we've been going down. Um, one of them is uh, a word that uh, Blake um, recently made me aware of. How do we pronounce this? Oh, uh, Lagome. La, 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 la <laughs> la he doesn't know. That's the, that's the answer. Uh, it's a Swedish word, Lagome. Um, and it, I think, roughly translated means just the right amount. Um, and I think Sinatra is just the right amount for web service. But I think in general, let's think about this. When we pick a tool, pick it not because, you know, partially obviously because it's like I need a web framework or I need a web tool or I need an email thing or whatever. Um, you obviously pick it for what it does. But I think picking it for the right size is, is important, something that's just the right amount, not too much and not too little. Um, and I think programmers are tend towards the over-design side of things. And we should make an active discipline, uh, or try to actively discipline ourselves to try to pull that back and try to tr tr try to balance that out so that we end up at just the right, just the right place for the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, one of the ways that we see this um, in in both Sinatra and REST client is just less less class definition. Um, you know, obviously classes are great. Object oriented programming is great, um, but you do get the sense sometimes reading Ruby programs that um, you know it's it's sort of the object oriented programming, like when all you have is a hammer kind of thing. Um, Java. <laughs> Making a class isn't always the right solution. Inheriting a class isn't always the right solution, and you see this with. Um, you see this with Active Resource. You see this with some other um, sort of HTTP clients, like uh, one uh, released recently, uh, HTTP Party. You can't make a request without first defining a class. Um, it's the same thing with uh, with a lot of web frameworks. You can't make an app without defining a class. Um, and uh, classes are obviously appropriate in many cases, but not just necessarily as the default, I think. So uh, this is something that's, that's in, been in my thinking, which is, use classes and use inheritance when they're, when they're appropriate. But sometimes a function call is what you want. Sometimes, uh, rather than overriding um, uh, uh, subclass inheritance, what you want is just an options hash, right? So how many of you have used SQL, the, the ORM? Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's the, the same thing. I mean, yeah. you, don't, you don't have to define a class to just start using it. You can just kind of you know, just stream a hash right into DB. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah it's pretty exactly cool. right. That's one of the things I like about that. Anyway, yeah, I've been so using, I just want to make that point. I've been using SQL pretty frequently mm -hmm. for, uh, for my apps. And, and yeah, I really like that you can start with that. You don't make a class. You just like throw some hashes right. in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then later on, if you want to turn that into a full-fledged class, you can. And you keep the same table in your database. Um, so yeah. There's this whole question of controller object mapping and routes versus, well, just URLs. Um, as far as I know, Sinatra is the only um, framework that does not do controller objects and, and routing, uh, or some sort of resource object and routing, where you map 
a URL to an object. And again, Ruby being an object-oriented language, we think we need to make everything out of objects, so therefore, of course, you need some mapping between a URL, which is just a string, a path, to an object. Yeah, if you ever send me a pull request with anything that looks even remotely close to a router, I will send it right back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not a big fan of them. <laughs> and that this has happened, I take it, yeah, because this I've is, had, this is so that. built into yeah. our thinking, right? right? It's like, you have to have a router. That's right. just, that is a part of a framework. Like, how else are you going to route things? Mm -hmm. um, and my answer to that is, don't fear the URLs. Um, I did a blog post about this a while back. It kind of made the rounds, raised a few hackles, I think. But it's just like URLs, when they're restfully created, they're actually kind of pretty, I think. Um, you know, we maybe, we, we maybe kind of got scared of them because of the days when, you know, you had these long CGI or maybe like a session, whatever, and we thought of URLs as being this ugly plumbing that needs to be hidden. But it can actually be pretty plumbing that can be visible. Um, and I find it, um, you know, the, uh, working with, with, say, Active Resource um, or another thing like that that kind of hides, you know, constructs the URLs for you, I like get, I'm like, well, wait, what is this hitting? And I'm not sure. And like, you know, and then you kind of are looking in your logs, but it's like, if you're just constructing a URL on the client side, and then you say what URL you want on the server side, it's just, it's just obvious. Um, and this comes into maybe one of the, one of the, the biggest overriding principles, which is expose your simplicity instead of hiding complexity. Now, clearly, hidden complexity beats exposed complexity. You know, you know, if you got a choice, if those are your only two choices, I will definitely take hidden complexity. Put it all in a black box and, and, and cover it up nicely. Um, but even better is when you can make it simple and then just show that. And to me, the, the, the URL mapping um, is a really great example of that, where it's just exactly visible what URLs are being used. And you can see that in your browser, and you can see that in your client when you're doing an API, and you can see that in your server, and it's all exposed. Um, and uh, I mean, we're hackers, right? We want to see the interior of things. And particularly if they're, if they're pretty and they're understandable, show them. Let's see them. Unless you're Scott Chacon, then you just dig into like this dirty stuff and love it. <laughs> The final principle I'll mention is actually based on a talk from RailsConf. And I'll confess this is a little odd because I didn't actually see this talk. I didn't go to it at all. Um, I just saw it in the, um, I saw it in the, in the, in the program guide. And, and it struck me that the, the title of the talk is just a great, a great quote. It's uh, Justin Getland uh, from Relevance that, that did the talk. So I don't know what the talk is about, but I love the title, Small Things Loosely Joined, Written Fast. Um, and that really describes the web services, REST client, Sinatra sort of uh, mindset uh, philosophy that, that I feel like is starting to develop. And SQL fits into that as well, I think. Um, and there's some other, some other tools that, that follow the same kind of approach. Build your things a little. Build them quickly. Um, and loosely couple them, right? And the web is, is obviously very well suited for loose coupling. And we can do that in our program code as well. Um, and it seems like this approach finally lets us escape that curse of always that, that fate that we thought that every application had to end up this huge monolithic sprawling thing that we just want to take out back to pasture and shoot in the head. Um, now, if we're building our, our applications are actually an assemble, uh, 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 an end user product is an assembly of small applications that are talking to each other in loosely coupled ways. It's very easy to take one of them and kind of like, you know, you want to rewrite it in a new language so it's faster or use a new framework or use some new tool. You can do that, right? It's decoupled. You need to scale it up. You can do that. Um, uh, and you can, and you know, new people coming into the project, they can take one little, one little piece of the, you know, one little app and just understand that. And if they understand the APIs and how that faces the world, um, then they are, that's an easier thing to get into than coming into the, you know, you kind of need to understand the whole application at once. So to me, this is, this, this, this approach, this sort of universe to building applications is something I'm very excited about. Um, Sinatra was the thing that inspired me to get thinking about this to begin with. Um, and now I'm building a lot of things in this way. Um, and I encourage you guys to try it out too because um, I think it works really well. There's a couple of URLs, the Sinatra uh, GitHub, uh, which has got a nice readme, the REST client, our docs, my own blog up there just for uh, self-promotional purposes. Um, that's what we got, thanks. Do you have questions? Um, question about the testing of the Sinatra framework. Mm -hmm. Isn't that very easy, or I guess easy to me to figure out how to test Sinatra coming out of the box? 
Okay. Uh, is, there a, is there a strategy guide for testing Sumatra framework? Uh, there's, there's, so the there's question, question was, uh, oh, yeah. uh, it's hard, uh, didn't understand, insufficient documentation on the testing frameworks? Okay. So I'm understanding. I'm not accusing you guys. Right? No, 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 it's okay. You, you had trouble so, understanding how right. to write tests so straight out of the, the box. The answer, the answer to your question is, is that there is, if you look in, um, uh, in, in, in the Sinatra gem itself, in the, in the source, there is a, um, a test directory under lib. And then, so if you require a Sinatra test spec, then you get test, you get test spec. Um, and then you have get it, put it, post it, and delete it. And you can send session, you can send uh, session information parameters, all of that. And then that actually returns the value of what you were looking for. Or no, I'm sorry, it doesn't actually return it. It, uh, it sets up the request for you, or even you get the response back. So it's using Rack's internal um, uh, mock request. So I, I learned everything I ever needed to know from Sinatra just from the readme. Yeah. That's kind of part of why we put this URL up yeah. here because you know GitHub shows the README by default. Basically, the README has everything you ever need to know. Yeah. Um, again, maybe fitting in the documentation, kind of that same style of uh, you know how the applications right. are built, right? One, I mean, one big file that tells you everything. Right. But well, I mean, one point I want to make with testing Sinatra is that uh, that you have get it, post it, put it, delete it, right? And um, I, I find it easy to use. If it's not, then let's let's work on it um, because it, it definitely needs to be easy. Um, but. Uh, uh, one second. Um, the, the one point I want to make, though, is that when you're, that's all you need to test Sinatra. Um, you don't need all of this other stuff because your, your URL should just be wrapped around like three lines of code. One line, two lines, three lines. Once you start getting around five lines inside that proc, then you need to start breaking that out into other classes or breaking it out into other things and test those in isolation. And then, so you're, you're basically get it, post it, put it, delete it. Those are actually functional tests. So you, you know, that's, that's what that's intended to be yeah, used for. Can, can I say something here really yeah. quick? Controller and view tests suck. Yeah. So just like if your controllers are short and you don't have yeah. to test them and all of your logic is in your model and model you know, unit testing yeah. works well and is easy and does not require any framework integration, right. then like you know, the whole thing almost becomes moot. I mean, I find it pretty yeah. easy to use, not just uh, yeah. I mean, you controller don't testing, but integration tests sometimes. But you know, put, 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 so, the hard, put the hard stuff in your models. Those are easy to test. That's pretty much it. Yes. I make a multi file Multi-file Sinatra app. So that's a really good question because it doesn't. There isn't a generator, right? Like you know, like Rails and Rails and Merb and all those have where they create the directory structure for you. Um, I typically, um, if my if I have app foo, I'll have my directory foo, and then I'll have a file in foo called foo.rb. And then from that, I usually have a lib directory, and then that's where I keep everything. And then I always do the require file file plus slash you know whatever. And then that's that's just typically the the standard convention I stick with. Um, uh, some other people do other things, um, use it other ways, um, but that's that's just typically how I how I do it. But if you go look if you go look at some of these examples like Scanty or um, mm -hmm. some of these others that are up here, they they all kind of follow a similar pattern: models and stuff in lib, views right. and views, specs in either specs or tests. Right. Um, Done. Say that again. Uh, well, 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 like Git, Wik Git Wiki's one. Um, you could do his your scanty his blog. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, there that's probably an easy one. Just write this short. Whoa. Uh, so there's an easy one right there. Anything else? Question about if you explore the roadmap or snapshot or what you want to take. Right. So the question is, is there a roadmap for Sinatra? And number two, whose branch is the canonical one that you should watch for what's really going on with it? Um, right now, watch Ryan Tomeko, <laughs> R. Tomeko on GitHub. Um, he's been maintaining the gym, bug fixes, all of that. And um, so, and he's usually always has great really killer patches that he's always doing. Uh, the other, I mean, the other is obviously myself. Um, I'm at the top of the network graph. I'm easy to find. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I've got, I have a Redux branch that's been sitting there for a few months. Um, I got really far with it. And then, uh, then, well, investors said we had to start really doing some cool stuff at Heroku. So we <laughs> kind of like, kind of tapered off. The, so. Um, but uh, short answer: Watch yeah. Ryan for stable changes. Watch yeah. Blake for uh, right. for what's like the really. So far it should changes. development on, on on my stuff should be should pick up pretty pretty soon. I hope. So anything else? Yeah. Um, how do you scale a Sinatra app on side So you get to reach some side of your Sinatra app.
Okay, so you mean code. So your, his question is, is how do you scale a Sinatra app? And I think what you mean in terms of lines of code? Like yeah. you, in terms of, um, the, move to Merb, <laughs> you know, or like, or start going to back to Rails um, if it becomes so big. Um, uh, but um, usually, if it's becoming that big, you should probably start thinking about breaking it up into little, other little apps, right? Um, so that's that's one method you can take. But if that's if if that's not a, if that's a path that you just can't do, then yeah, start moving to Merp. Go to you know go back to you know go to Rails. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Question is: Does REST client automatically parse the result, uh, which is a really cool feature that HTTP Party, uh, which was written after I wrote REST client, does? Uh, no, and that's actually one feature I might want to steal. Part of what I wanted to do with REST client is keep it really simple, where you do the get and you get back the raw results, um, and it's just a string. Um, and I, I really like the simplicity of that. You don't get back a result object that then you have to deal with, um, and it's very, very easy to parse things. I mean. I mean, talking about like JSON, it's require JSON and then JSON dot parse space rest client dot get space URL. I mean, so it's it's so easy to do that. Um, but it, but it would be a it would be a cool cool feature to add that potentially. I don't know Is if we it? fully answered the question about the roadmap or at all. The roadmap. Did I? Two questions. I mean, where, I mean, maybe what he's asking is, is there any cool stuff that's upcoming that you want to tell us about? Yeah, I've got this, this new concept of filters um, that if you currently look at the way Git post, put, delete work, they actually are, um, they're, it's, it's kind of, there's already like this request type, like event, like object. Um, I'm doing away with that. And what you have is just raw filters. And then get, post, put, delete are actually um, prefabricated uh, chain filters, you know, chains of filters. So um, which once I started on that concept, I got really excited about it and went to town on. And then eventually just kind of went for a minute for a little while. So but that's, that's, that's where I want to go with it. I want to get it, get it that way. So yeah, the code in Sinatra changes a lot. <laughs> Any others? All right, cool. then. Well, thank you very much. I guess we're done. Thanks. Yeah.